the land back to the people who have ties to that land, return their homes, return their land. And um, I think that's the only definition of decolonized to me. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to introduce the main speaker. <laughs> um, okay, so Professor Mazen Kumsia is founder and volunteer, director of the Palestine Institute for Bi Bi Biodiversity and Sustainability, PEIBS. Is it called PIBS? PIBS maybe? At Bethlehem University, Kumsia established over 160 scientific papers, over 30 book chapters, and several books on topics ranging from cultural heritage to human rights to biodiversity, conservation to cancer. Currently leading the effort to produce the new National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan for Palestine, he serves on the board of a number of Palestinian youth and and service organizations. And he oversees many projects related to sustainability of human and natural communities. He is laureate of the Paul K. Feyerabend Foundation Award, I hope I said that correctly, the Tekrim Award, amongst many others. Professor Kumsia is joined by his wife, Jesse Chang, co-founder of the Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and Sustainability Center. Please help me welcome Professor Mazen Kumsia. Okay, thank you all for coming here. I uh, really appreciate uh, Don and uh, the other group here, Cleveland Peace Action, and others who invited us to come. This is not my first time in Cleveland. I came here before the pandemic, of course, and then we were all stuck, so and then come again, but it's an honor to be among you uh, another time. Uh, how many of you have heard me speak before? Raise your hand. There's three, four people. Uh, a few more. How many of you have been to Palestine? One, two, wow, quite a number of you. That's great. The rest of you must come. <laughs> And uh, those of you who have been, uh, welcome to come back again and visit with us. Um, so <clears throat> what I'll do is very briefly go over some aspects of colonization related to environmental justice. This is what I will do. And the message, take home message that I want to give you is a hopeful message that colonization ends, freedom comes, people will live together, diversity, diversity is strength. These are the messages I will uh, speak about. Uh, my major advisor, and, uh, when I did my PhD, used to tell me, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them in the middle, and then at the end, tell them again. So don't worry, I'll tell you those messages <laughs> at the end one more time, if you get lost in the middle. Um, but anyway, Jesse and I were in the US for many years, uh, more than a quarter century, and we came back to Palestine in 2008, and we started this institute in 2014. Um, and what is Palestine, and where is it? Palestine is, of course, an intersection of continents, that's where humans migrated out of Africa to the rest of the world. So congratulations, your ancestors are Palestinian, whether you wanted that distinction or not. Uh, but the geography and the geology is um, actually made it a very rich biodiversity area. That's why it's the uh, part of the Fertile Crescent, the western part of the Fertile Crescent, where humans first developed agriculture, domesticated plants and animals. And this allowed humans, about 12,000 years ago, to bring a, begin a process of what we call civilization. Uh, I say begin because I, I don't think we're civilized yet. <laughs> it's a process in, in the making, it's okay. Uh, but that's invention of alphabet, uh, laws, you know, like Hammurabi's laws development of religions, development of agricultural techniques and tools that spread to the rest of the world from Palestine. Palestine was always a rich 
country, very rich country, one of the most pleasant countries to live and the easiest to live in. People could live in a few dunums, uh, uh, three or four acres of land would be sufficient for the family to live off. So most Palestinians were uh, living off of sustainable agriculture. Before 1948, 75% of Palestinians lived off of sustainable agriculture. Now it's less than 4%. Uh, it's a presence at, at this crossroads of civilizations and between Egypt, Mesopotamia, etc. also made our population diverse. There's a picture from 1932 Palestine, for example, showing religious and secular leaders of Palestinians. The woman, by the way, in there with the black hat, her name is Matya Muhannam. She was elected president of the Palestine Women Union. She's a Protestant woman, which is kind of interesting that the Protestant woman, Protestants represent 0.2% of the population of Palestine, was elected by Muslims, other Christians, Greek Orthodox, etc., as president of this woman union. This woman union led the first demonstration in human history that actually used automobiles in its uh, demonstration, 120 cars, in 1928, driving down the old streets of Jerusalem, beeping their horns, making a big fuss, <laughs> made the uh, uh, pages of London Times, and etc. Palestine has always been multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious, and even multilingual society. Before 1948, there were 44 languages spoken in Palestine. I don't know if you know this or not. Of course, this has changed. And we'll come to that issue, which is colonization. But before that, this brief glimpse that I gave you of Palestine tells you what? Tells you that Palestine was rich, healthy, diverse society for thousands of years. Thousands of years. Has there been conflict through these thousands of years, 12,000 year history? The answer is resoundingly no. Palestine if not, uh, you know, one of the most peaceful countries on earth, it may be the most peaceful country on earth. Some of you are looking at me skeptical. <laughs> I understand that because you watch CNN and Fox News and everything else, and you're focused on what's happening at this moment. But the reality is, uh, Jesse, I think that's maybe our phone. Um, so, anyways, um, Palestine was relatively healthy uh, in terms of no conflict. For example, if you take away this conflict, then you'd have to go back to the Crusaders to get the conflict, to get another conflict. That's hundreds of years ago. What happened in between? Nothing. You drop a pin, you hear it. <laughs> it's peaceful country. All right, now, I'm, my background is also medical genetics. And why is it important for me to look at a patient history? Well, I want to know if his problem now, or her problem, is congenital. <laughs> it's always been there. Congenital problems are much harder to cure than, let's say, COVID-19 <laughs> or something that comes and goes. In this case, thank God, we're not a congenital problem that we have a conflict, endless conflict. That gives us possibilities for cures. So that's why we take a patient history. That's why I give you a glimpse of history. Once you do that, once your doctor does that, for example, if you have ever visited a doctor, takes patient demographics and history, then you go to the current problem. What is your problem? What's your symptoms? When did they start? What, what's going on now? You know? Well, you know, I don't want you to get lost in the symptoms. What is the problem? Why did it start? It's a very simple problem. It's one of the simplest problems on earth. Again, some of you are saying, did they give him enough coffee today? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's not very complicated. 
There was problems of world history where empires were dissolving in Europe, changing to nation states, and nation states by definition discriminate against minorities. So there was discrimination against Muslims, for example, in Europe there, in the 19th century, we're talking about uh, when empires dissolved. There was discrimination against uh, uh, Protestants in majority Catholic countries, or Catholics in majority Protestant countries, or, or gypsies, Roma people, or Jews, etc. There was discrimination in the 19th century. And it was going up like this. Now, what's the response to discrimination? Well, most people, you know, they have one of two responses only. There's no third response. Fight or flight, right? <laughs> That's like animals when they face danger. So some, <coughs> some of the Jews in Europe, a minority, by the way, compared to the rest of the Jewish population in Europe, said, heck with it, let's go make our own state where? In Palestine. <laughs> A logical to go to Palestine, right? Um, this, is, this is the crux of the problem. This idea is called Zionism, political Zionism to create a Jewish state in Palestine. A problem for them, which is still a problem today for them, is that this is the representatives of Palestine. And you can see, OK, there is one Jewish rabbi among them. And there was, there was uh, and these are all, all population in Palestine objected to this idea, including the Jews that lived in Palestine. The 3% Jewish population of Palestine, native indigenous Jews, did not want Zionism. They didn't want the Jewish state. They were living, as you can see, happily, with diversity, they had no problem. So they rejected the idea of Zionism. So the Zionists have to face this problem that 97% are not Jewish, and the 3% who's Jewish, they don't want them. <laughs> So what are they going to do? Well, the answer was obvious. The locals have to go. And this is what happened precisely in 1948 and 49 and 50. There was large ethnic cleansing. If you want to read about it, like Ilan Papi's book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, over 500 villages and towns were depopulated. You can see them on the right uh, picture. And, uh, and then Israel was created on 78% of Palestine. Yeah. And in 1967, it occupied the rest of Palestine, which is the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, plus the Golan Heights from Syria and Sinai from Egypt, and proceeded to repeat the process of ethnic cleansing and building settlements. Today, there are 15 million of us Palestinians in the world. Eight million of us are refugees or displaced people. And the rest are squeezed into increasingly shrinking areas. How many of you have seen the shrinking map of Palestine before? Many, most of you have. <laughs> uh, do you know the origin of this map and how did it came about? It was actually my son when he was 13 years old in 1998 when he saw this map at the bottom of shrinking United States, uh, where the Indians, so-called Indians, Native Americans, ended up in reservations. Mm -hmm. And he came to me and said, Dad, isn't this what happened to your country? I said, no, son, this is what happened to your country. <laughs> and he said, well, shouldn't you draw a map like this for Palestine? I said, no, shouldn't you draw a map like this for Palestine? <laughs> So he did, and I used it in one of my books, and other people have started using it. Don't worry, no copyrights. I'm not a fan of copyright. <laughs> uh, what is this? The diagnosis here is what? The settler colonialism, OK? It's important to remember this diagnosis. It's important not to get confused and uh, you know, kind of get lost in the myriad of other potential diagnoses, plural that could be given for this condition, like a religious conflict, like some sort of a, a fight, a dispute over a military occupation or anything else. Now, why is it important to make the right diagnosis? If I have cancer, 
and I go to a doctor and he looks at the symptoms and says, okay, you have a headache, you have skin rash, you have anemia. For the headache, take aspirin. For the skin rash, take a cream. And for the anemia, eat some spinach and go home. I'll be dead soon, okay? <laughs> you have to treat the illness, not treat the symptoms of the illness. You know, checkpoints that uh, Fatim talks about. There's a, there's a tiny, minor, uh, rather insignificant even symptom of this uh, underlying very, very serious diagnosis, right? So it is important to make the diagnosis. The second point I want to make about diagnosis is what is the main you know, way that you know that you have the right diagnosis? How do do good doctors, sometimes you go to two doctors, they'll give you two different diagnoses. How do they determine if they have the right diagnosis? Well, if all the symptoms and the tests fit that diagnosis, then it's the right diagnosis. If you find symptoms that, uh, you know, maybe that make you question, then you go back or a question. I'll give you an example. In my own village of Beit Sahur, we had a cow revolt in 1988. You heard about the... Uh, terroristic fugitive cows that we imported. Uh, there were 18 cows that we smuggled into town because the Israeli military has a military order that says Palestinians cannot own milking cows. We can own milking rats and milking mice, but not milking cows. And of course, we, we had to smuggle them, hide them, military start military operation to find these fugitive terroristic cows supplying this substance called MILK that's uh, dangerous. Uh, okay, now if you think of just this minor symptom, what does it fit? Does it fit a religious uh, problem, conflict? You know, cows are religious. <laughs> the owner, who are the owners of the cows? My village is 12,000 people. All of it was in on this crime of smuggling cows. <laughs> and 70% of the people were Christian, 30% are Muslim. So it cannot be a religious conflict. Can it be a military occupation? The answer is resoundingly no. Sorry. Many Palestinians even tell today, many Israelis, Israeli friends of mine, ah, the military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza should end. Kibush, as they say in Hebrew, uh, the occupation was sent. Uh, sorry, but it's not military occupation. How do I know? Well, the Germany occupied France for many years. I didn't tell the French people, you can't have your milking cows, you know? <laughs> right? It, it doesn't fit. So if that symptom, that one tiny symptom, again, doesn't fit, then you ought to rethink your diagnosis. Does it fit settler colonialism? Absolutely yes. For the same reason that these white, beautiful European settlers who brought technology and music and everything to the West uh, killed millions of these uh, creatures called buffaloes. Why did they kill the buffaloes? Was it a religious conflict, a misunderstanding, a language dispute? It was very clear, they don't want these natives, and this is the food of the natives. It's, it's as simple as that. It's logical. I would like you to start to think about issues globally, including climate change and other things, in a logical fashion. And, and the logic, actually, as a scientist, to me, makes you understand what needs to be done to achieve peace, human rights, things that we all speak about. Uh, nice words that sometimes our politicians speak, but of course they don't implement. Now, I could talk endlessly about the symptoms. So we talked about patient history, and we talked about diagnosis, and the symptoms, I gave you an example of the symptoms, but I can talk endlessly about the symptoms. I can, for example, talk about the violence, if you want. Colonization does not happen without violence. I cannot come to your home and land here in Cleveland and say, hey, would you kindly please leave because I like your house and I want to make it mine? It doesn't happen. You have to use violence if you're going to colonize somebody's land and homes, and etc. Violence is intrinsic to colonialism. 
And that's why 100,000 Palestinians have been killed and more than 800,000 have been injured. Now, I could talk about symptoms ranging from the walls, the settlements, all these things. I do want to talk briefly about one symptom related to environmental issues because you don't hear much about environmental injustice. Now many of you know that globally we face a major environmental nakba, as we say in Arabic, catastrophe, right? Uh, you know this. You know that there is now approximately more estimates that there's more plastics in the ocean than there are fi uh, fish in the oceans. Mm -hmm. And you see climate change happening all around us with floods and hurricanes and fires in Canada and Hawaii and all of this stuff. These are things that impact us, impact humanity. Settler colonialism and wars are also impacting our environment. For example, the Israeli military alone produces more greenhouse gases than all the population of Palestinian population of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip combined. The Israeli military alone. The American military, of course, is vastly more. <laughs> uh, but you know that because the American military is like the size of the next eight militaries combined. Uh, we're the largest by, by far in terms of spending on military and using jet fuel and fossil fuels for military um, uses. This is what's killing our planet. Uh, these six threats that you see up there are killing our planet. And I, as a scientist, if I think about it logically, I say we have 50-50 chance of making it as humanity. But relative to us in Palestine, of course, you have problems. For example, when Israel destroyed these Palestinian villages and towns, they uprooted all the trees around them, diverse trees, a polyculture of both domestic trees and wild trees, and they replaced that with pine trees, pinus salpensis. They chose pine trees because they grow fast and because they cover up the crimes that they committed of ethnic cleansing. Uh, but pine trees are also in a dry climate are susceptible to fires. With climate change, this is increasing even. So you can see these fires, for example, in West Jerusalem, and actually in the past few uh, weeks in the Galilee fires. And uh, in this case in West Jerusalem, ironically, after the fire, the terraces that our ancestors built and had planted over thousands of years uh, were exposed because the fire consumed the cover of pine trees. There was a diversion of the water of the Jordan River Basin, which was devastating to the environment of the Jordan uh, River area. Uh, the picture on the uh, left-hand corner is what River Jordan looked like when you had boats in it and everything. It went down from 1,350 million cubic meters per year to only 20 million cubic meters per year. Literally, it's in some places less than two yards width. You can walk across it and the water won't get to your knees. It's no longer a river, it's a tiny meandering stream. And this has resulted in the desertification of the Jordan Valley, as you can see from this uh, satellite image. Israel dubs itself as having made the desert green, right? You may have heard this, that they have made the desert green. Actually, Israel increased the amount of arid land in our country by its creation and by its diversion of water and by various other mechanisms, including the, the uh, destruction of a polyculture and replacing it with a monoculture. Uh, so actually, this image shows the, how desertification is coming in the area of the Jordan Valley, the yellowish areas. The red line is actually the line of the 400 millimeter rainfall. And that's usually the rainfall millimeters that produce satellite imagery that produces green areas. And you can see that Israel did not increase one uh, square kilometer or square mile of green areas in our region. 
Um, instead, they did things like this, for example, the draining of the wetlands of the Hula area in the north. There was a lake there and wetlands, and they drained those. The picture on the lower right-hand corner is a Palestinian woman harvesting reeds from these areas. Uh, all the Palestinian communities around Lake Hula and the wetlands there were uprooted, became refugees in 1948, and uh, the area was drained. Uh, they called it draining the swamps. To me, so the word swamp is really a bad word. Uh, it's wetlands. It's useful for people. Mm -hmm. It's useful for nature. 219 species other than the human. <laughs> Humans, the Palestinians around the area were depopulated. Uh, there are many aspects of what Israel does that is uh, throwing dust in the face of the world about these things. Just uh, another example here, the map on the left is taken from Israeli sources in English. It shows so-called protected areas in green. Now, <clears throat> when you look at this map, it's peculiar in that a lot of the protected areas are in the Jordan Valley and in the Galilee and in the Negev in the south. Why is that? That's where the Palestinians remain and where they are to be ethnically cleansed. So the use of so-called nature reserve or protected area in Israel is to exclude Palestinians, not to protect nature. Evidence for this is overwhelming. I can send you, um, I, had, I have a monograph now finished with 650 references in it. Uh, I'll give you a very simple example from the South Hebron Hills, where you can see in the South Hebron Hills, the green is the so-called protected area. On top of it sits a military training zone, the red area. <laughs> How could you have, by the way, a nature reserve and also a military training zone on top of that area? In that area, this is what they do, military training, you know, of their tanks and bombing it. And we find shelves like there, very unusual kinds of uh, uh, testing all their military equipment in those so-called nature reserves. While at the same time, they arrest children like these two children for picking wild thyme, wild, wild oregano, za'atar, <laughs> in this area because they are trespassing on so-called nature reserve. And they demolish schools like this one in the South Hebron Hills because they claim it's built in the nature reserve, which they designated after they occupied the area in 1967. Now, <clears throat> the other thing that's peculiar about the state of Israel is uh, that these nature reserves, the green areas, are designated by whom? But what entity in the state of Israel designates these? <laughs> You'd be surprised. It's not even any entity within the state of Israel. It's the Jewish National Fund, a supranational entity established in 1905 for colonization of Palestine. That's what they said on their website, on their notes and literature and everything. It's an entity to colonize Palestine. Okay, how many nature scientists does the Jewish National Fund that planted all these pine trees in the state of Israel, how many natural scientists does it employ? Zero. <laughs> Okay, so clearly this is not about nature. This is not unusual in world history, by the way. If you go back in this country, the first, do you know what's the first nature reserve or protected area? Anybody? Quiz. I'm, I'm being a professor here, so I'm acting like a professor with my students. It's Yellowstone, okay? Yellowstone National Park. And it's actually the first in the world, not just in the U.S., as a nationally determined protected area. If you go back to the literature and check when they submitted to Congress to approve this, they wrote as one of the main reasons to exclude the Indians. Okay? <laughs> to exclude the Indians. Interesting. It's a mechanism. The only difference, by the way, between the state of Israel and the United States is that 
The nature reserve, yes, excluded the Indians, but remained the nature reserve. In our areas, it doesn't remain a nature reserve, it's developed. It's developed for Israeli industrial settlements, Israeli residential settlements, military training zones, as I showed you, <coughs> or other reasons that they use. They use the same idea for national parks. I don't have much time to talk about it because in Israel, unlike the rest of the world, Israel is unique in saying citizenship and nationality are two different things. Who are nationals? When they say national park, national refers to the nation. Who is the nation? A nation is a Jewish nation. Israel is the only country that defines its nation not as the people within the country, but anybody who is Jewish in the world is part of Ami Israel, the nation, nation of Israel, the, the Jewish people. So a national park in the context of Israel, like the one that is designated around Jerusalem that includes uh, Silman and Sheikh Jarrah, is about uh, property of the Jewish nation, not property of the nation of people that exist in that country. Actually, every Jew in the world, by Israeli law, by Zionist uh, criteria, every Jew in the world, including converts to Judaism, are nationals of the state, whether they want it or not. Whereas all Palestinians are not national, even if they are citizens of the state. This is why I said Israel is unique among the world. And they codified that in laws. You can read them if you are curious. But they use these national parks, because they are for the Jewish nation, to exclude the Palestinians and demolish Palestinian homes, prevent them from even repairing a roof in Silwan or Sheikh Jarrah, while allowing Jewish residents to build uh, you know, multi-story buildings in the supposed national park. Our students do study these things, and we publish papers on these things. And you can uh, uh, read them on our website if you want, like the effect of Israeli industrial settlements, etc. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> there's the use of natural resources in the country, which again, in any other country, natural resources belong to the people of that country and are shared equally with the people, regardless of whether they're Muslims, Christians, Jews, or whatever. In our case, 95% of the water of the West Bank, for example, it is for Jewish use only, not for Palestinian use. Christian, Muslims, whatever. We are left with 5%. So in Bethlehem, for example, where I live, in the area of Bethlehem, I'm right next to Bethlehem, in a small village called Beit Sahur, the shepherd's field where the shepherds heard the angels sing, went up to, up the hill, literally, the church of nativity where Jesus was born, is just up the hill from my house. We, get water occasionally, sporadically, at the whim of the Israeli uh, occupiers, if you like to use that term, but I prefer the Israeli colonizers, because that's a more accurate term. Whereas settlers right next to us, less than a mile away from my home, there's a settlement. And in this settlement, they get water 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no restrictions with cheap cost. They even have swimming uh, pools and green uh, gardens, yards, uh, grass. They even have in one settlement near Bethlehem, they have a water park. Imagine a water park when the desert is already creeping up to Bethlehem area because of their actions. This is again, you know, <laughs> the notion that Israel is a green country is just so blatant lie just this picture alone. This is the only forested area between Bethlehem and Jerusalem in 1997 on the top, called Jabal Abu right next to my house. And actually, they took land from uh, my relatives in the valley for this colonial uh, settlement. And what it looked like at the top in 1997, what it looks like at the, uh, a few years later at the bottom. 
Um, again, my students and um, us, we do research like on decline in vertebrate biodiversity. I used to go to that hill as a child, uh, catch butterflies and watch birds and things like that. So again, this is a country that dubs itself as a green country, as uh, making the desert bloom. Uh, this is making the desert bloom, if you want. Now, this is the symptom I said I'll talk about environmental symptoms. <coughs> now I want to talk about, so we covered history, patient history, diagnosis, symptoms. That leaves two more items. For the diagnosis, I said settler colonialism. That leaves what's a therapy for settler colonialism and what's a prognosis for settler colonialism, right? Well, let's talk about prognosis. Luckily for us, and when I have patients, uh, when I was at Duke Medical Schools, etc., if I get an orphan disease, it's more difficult because there's hardly any cure. But if I get a common thing, it's easier. So, uh, so if there are other patients, a lot of other patients with the disease, it's easier to deal with because you can see the outcome of those other patients, right? Makes sense. So the same here. Every country on earth, by the way, had settler colonials. There's no country that escaped that diagnosis. Do you know a country that escaped it? None. Even neutral Switzerland, why do they have South Switzerland speak Italian? Because they got Roman colonization. Uh, Romans also colonized England, by the way. <laughs> Some of you, if you have British, Ancestry that doesn't mean you have, uh, you know, uh, ancestry just from the island. You probably have Roman blood also. And now DNA allows us to see this frequently, by the way. So, okay. So, if we have all these other countries with this, what was the outcome in those other countries? Well, there's three possible scenarios or outcomes. The most common scenario found in most countries on Earth, or essentially 160 countries, which is, as a, as a, a scientist, as a medical geneticist, I would say that's the most likely to happen, is that the descendants of the colonizers and the descendants of the colonized live in one country after the idea of colonization kind of uh, withers away. This happened, for example, in all of South America, all of Latin America, Central America, Caribbean islands, Cuba, Puerto Rico, you know, in North America and Mexico and Canada and all of Europe and all of Asia, most of the countries of Asia, etc. And in Africa recently, as you know, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe and South Africa and the apartheid and the whites are living with the black people in South Africa. This is scenario A, if you want. Very common scenario. So we probably don't even need to talk about the other two scenarios because they're very, very unlikely to happen. And in any case, if they happen, they are really very bloody. Scenario B is what happened in Algeria where one million French pack their bags and go to Europe. After six, seven, eight generations in Algeria, some of them have never seen France in their lives and they had to go. They even spoke French with a different accent uh, than uh, the people in the mainland of France. Um, this was very bloody. It cost something like three million Algerian lives and 150,000 French lives. To this day, by the way, uh, people are still railing from, from the effect of this bloody, bloody <coughs> you know, issue. Very rare, by the way, this to happen. And the likelihood of it happening in our country is near zero. I never say zero because, <laughs> you know, you never know. But the third scenario is also kind of rare and near zero probability of happening. And that is genocide of the native people, as happened in this country and as happened in Australia with the Aborigines. Also, I would say near zero, but not necessarily 100%, I'm certain that the patient will not go down that road. 
because there are even Israeli ministers in the current government who are calling for genocide of the Palestinians. They are calling for making Gaza flat as a football field, as one of them said. Uh, so, okay. But as a scientist, I say a scenario one is the most likely. And in the 21st century, you know, the likelihood of scenario two and three uh, in our country is, as I said, near zero. This is a prognosis. So that leaves us with one item only to talk about, which is therapy. What, what is going to lead us to that inevitable outcome of one country with all its citizens? That's reclaiming the diversity which we lost thanks to the Zionist project, by the way. So it's logical, OK? How, how are you going to get there? Like the other countries, you have to start it. You have to have resistance. And so like this frog, by the way, <laughs> we are resisting because it's an existential struggle for us. Uh, we struggle in various ways, and I want to just highlight a couple of ways that I personally, as Mazen and Jesse, struggle. I will say about I'm president of the Rotary Club in Bethlehem, and we did a number of activities as a Rotary Club uh, to help the people, including uh, delivering aid to orphanages. We did a project in Gaza where we helped the women. Uh, you know, developed, uh, we developed 30 community health activators, all women, and those 30 trained 4,500 women on best nutritious practices and even gave them vitamins, things like that, especially pregnant women, etc. Uh, these are just some of the pictures of the beneficiaries from our project in Gaza. We delivered healthcare equipment to hospitals like Caritas Baby Hospital, Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, uh, monitoring equipment, incubators. When COVID-19 hit, we delivered equipment like PCR machines to uh, also to Caritas where we set up a testing center in Bethlehem for the COVID-19. And we delivered uh, family needy family supports during the lockdown of COVID-19. We delivered water uh, to schools. Uh, these provide filtered cool water for children in uh, 35 schools. Um, so far that we have delivered to and we hope to expand this project. I talked to a Rotarian club actually today uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and I hope they can help us in some of our projects. Uh, we did a community garden also by the help of the Rotarians in Bethlehem, us basically donating money and we started this uh, a community garden where children, even from the refugee camps, can come and, uh, and work there. Uh, <clears throat> since my voice is going now, it's Jesse's turn. Where <laughs> Jesse? Uh, you can talk to them about the Institute, the Palestine Institute of Biodiversity and Sustainability. And uh, you, can, you can use this one. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's on. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um so my name is Jesse, and uh, we're married for almost uh, almost 40 years. And I've lived in, uh, and I've lived in uh, Palestine for uh, almost 15 years, and um, and we started this institute in 2014 uh, from scratch. And in the middle of the 2014, so this is our ninth year uh, of the institute, and we started with the, our, our goal. The institute's goal is to research 
and educate in conservation. So everything we wanted to teach, uh, we must uh, do research and have uh, all the knowledge and data so that we can uh, in, uh, impart this information to the children, school children or uh, college students, or the common uh, uh, population. And then uh, those activity, education, uh, will lead to hopefully uh, everybody there will conserve the nature and the biodiversity and the environment there. And our institute currently have uh, lots of uh, activities. For example, we have a museum of natural history, which is a small one, but we have uh, a goal of expanding it in a couple years. Uh, Palestine uh, and the Botanical Garden and Eco Garden, Biodiversity Center, which is a research uh, including some molecular uh, research uh, facilities, uh, environmental impact assessment to, to help uh, assess uh, environment uh, if uh, any uh, other uh, places need some of the consulting and consultancy service. Uh, we also have cultural heritage uh, exhibition and community garden, children's exploration playground, uh, animal rehabilitation unit, molecular lab, uh, a barium, and, and we have a new uh, uh, bachelor's program called the Bio Biodiversity and Sustainability at Batson University which is a first uh, program uh, bachelor's degree in that part of the world. Uh, so this fall, hopefully, we will have some uh, students uh, signing up for that program starting in September. And this, you can see the picture uh, of our site. Uh, on the uh, central, in the middle of the picture, you see a uh, solar panel that is our uh, main Building that we operated uh, in, and then in the in a, in a, I think at the south uh, southwest direction from that building, or uh, no, it's a north northwest north north of that building. It's outside the picture. You don't see it in this picture. We will have an expansion of our exhibition uh, museum space. So you will see a lot of space at our garden and trees and orchards that we, and a greenhouse. And this is some of the picture, a uh, closer picture of uh, what the building looks like and, and the pond that we have uh, developed, uh, which is a, a natural, uh, you know, water creatures and provide water for the bees. We have beehives and uh, all the insects and animals, birds that come through there. Um, our beehives, uh, while we are away on this travel, uh, the, the staff have harvest the honey, um, 20, 30 kilos of honey. And this is some of the picture images of our exhibition, uh, the bird exhibition and the insect, the mineral and uh, ethnography exhibition. So we got the visitors uh, very frequently. Every every week there are several groups. And when the semester starts, when the school starts in September, we will have a school uh, a field trip to come to visit the museum. This is the ethnography exhibition. Uh, and then uh, another uh, picture is we take our uh, specimens to uh, the facility uh, uh, in centers to show the children's. Um, oh, that's the next one. Mm -hmm. So the picture on the uh, left is we took the uh, exhibition to the center with a, a kids with a, a mental uh, uh, development uh, issues. And in our botanical garden, we have, like Mazen said, we have a community garden on the lower right. And on the lower left, you see our harvest. Uh, we do have a different, uh, two different seasons of crops. So in the summer crop, we will grow summer uh, 
uh, vegetables in the winter crop. We grow winter vegetables. And the top, uh, top right is the, our aquaponic system. Aquaponic system is a uh, closed system where we grow uh, vegetables and <coughs> fish at the same time. Um, which is in our environment, you will have uh, less uh, water consumption, uh, uh, take less spaces for a uh, community or places that have limited space, uh, land space, or in our case, uh, Palestine with the limited water resources. Uh, we also work uh, uh, with a women co-op. We help uh, women set up their co-op and produce uh, uh, local produce and their homemade uh, products and for sell uh, to, to improve their economic situation. And we also have a, a regular uh, program to teach uh, local women how to make uh, organic uh, natural uh, products with the herbs, with herbs that are uh, people can grow and the herbs that are found that's growing in the museum garden. Um, so some of the things that they learn is including like a facial cream or the hair, uh, hair cream and, and uh, shampoo or uh, health care, you know, a skin care product. And we do have a regular uh, children's activity, education activity, like uh, we mentioned before. Uh, we also have summer camp, especially this past summer. Uh, many other uh, centers, they have summer camp, and they will bring their uh, summer campers to our museum uh, in the grounds and in the garden to learn about Palestine nature and biodiversity, and how to uh, reduce the trash, uh, how to conserve, uh, keep the environment clean. These are some of the uh, photos of children uh, doing the learning uh, by using their hand. So we always have activity uh, with hands-on act activity and the fun activity for, for example, uh, this is, uh, I think children are making uh, some bread uh, things with the flour, with some uh, herbs, mixed with the herbs, so they will learn about herbs, and maybe they will go, they will go to the garden and identify a different kind of herbs, and harvest some herbs, and make uh, bread. And we are very, very excited to, uh, to have a, uh, one and the only mobile museum, uh, the picture on the right. Mm -hmm. uh, the mobile museum, you can see it's a, a very uh, decorative uh, nature of themes. And we take those mobile museum to uh, the community, uh, a disadvantaged community, a rural community, where some of the uh, kids uh, or the uh, community are not able to come to the uh, Bethlehem, to our facility. And so we take our uh, exhibition to them. So um, every, when the school starts also, we will have more of this activity. And during the summer, the school is not in session. So they get, a, uh, our mobile museum get some rest. But uh, when the school starts, uh, our team will be busy with uh, uh, field, taking the mobile museum to the field. And you can see this are our children's exploration uh, playground. Um, a more picture of children learning and doing uh, by hands. Okay, so this is the last one. And this is pretty recent, right? August 1st. This August 1st, we received, uh, we rescued five baby striped hyenas. <coughs> hyenas is uh, in, in local in uh, Palestine. A lot of them found in the Hebron, South Hebron Hill area. And we use uh, this opportunity to uh, educate children uh, about hyena uh, 
what do they eat and um, they're not uh, uh, dangerous animals and how kids should uh, not uh, uh, in, uh, like uh, hurt any wild animals and not to be afraid of wild and to protect the wild animals. So in this picture, our German volunteer is uh, taking care, uh, showing the hyena to children. Uh, those hyena cubs only um, like uh, maybe a month. So uh, since we have uh, been on this trip for two weeks, so the hyena probably have grown and we're making some uh, outdoor space for those uh, hyenas to, to be free and roam. Uh, but they're still uh, being nursing right now. Uh, more pictures about children in, in the garden and learning and playing and have fun what they learn. And I do want to um, talk about our practice at the Institute. Is we are uh, we're living in the, uh, trying to achieve zero waste uh, principle. Of course, uh, not absolute zero waste, but uh, whenever there is possible not to, to generate solid waste, we will come up with uh, solutions to do that. So for, that's why we will have, uh, let me see if I have any photos of that. Yeah, we will have uh, we have uh, warm compost. We have traditional compost. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we have um, uh, uh, we have chicken that to uh, take care of some of the waste. And we go to the uh, vegetable market to uh, haul back the produce that they're not going to sell anymore. Uh, some it's kind of like. A, dumpster dive, but we go to the market to bring them. And the, then we sort them. Some could be good for people to, u to use, and some for the animals to use, and some goes to the compost. So uh, no organic waste goes to the solid waste. And we will try to uh, cut down any waste from the beginning. So we, do, we have less to worry about recycling, because recycling use energy recycling also uh, uh, there's a limited uh, opportunity or facility to recycle in Palestine uh, I'm gonna turn back to Mazen to finish the other part of the presentation um. Yeah, I can just yell, so uh, I'll this thing. Use this. So, yes, uh, I forgot to introduce myself earlier, Don Bryant, Cleveland Beast Section. But uh, another guest has uh, arrived a little bit later, Phil Genio, director of the American Indian Movement of Ohio. And we wanted to hear from him. He was going to give open, opening remarks, but he'll give his remarks now. And the question, as Fatten had answered before, is, uh, what has colonization done to you, your family, and your community? And what is your vision of decolonization? Please come up, Philip. And Philip and Mazin met on Zoom about six months ago. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. You know, we don't, uh, we don't normally get an education like this from somebody that lives that life in that place where these things are happening. Uh, decolonization to me means, uh, for, for my people, is the end of restrictions on things that we do uh, as a people for our, from our spiritual uh, and uh, ceremonial uh, things. To give you an example, uh, it was the National Park System that said, finally said that it was fine for us to go and forage for our medicines in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, yet the Clinton Metro Park still won't let us do it. So the things that I do, I'm doing according to their laws, is illegal. You know, the uh, Cuyahoga River's beautiful river when you get down there in the valley, 
but the fact of the matter is it's the sandy bottom. There's no stones in there for us to gather our our uh, our grandfathers to take in the sweat lodge. So I have to go to the Rocky River or Chagrin River and sneak in at night. So I absolutely understand the things that, that your people are going through and, and we have a shared struggle. Yeah. And I don't think that there are enough people that are out there shouting uh, in support of Palestine. Um, and I think it's probably because they're afraid of, of uh, the repercussions from the Jewish community. Because when you say something against the government there, you're an anti-Semite. I don't have that problem because I don't care how they feel. That's just how I am. That's just how I've been raised. And I speak truth and a lot of people don't like truth because it's ugly. So I absolutely understand. Uh, fantastic programs that you have going with, with teaching the children, um, the recycling and, and things of that nature. Uh, trying not to be wasteful of a lot of food sources, especially when they're you know, on their way to be expired vegetables and fruits. It's, I don't think a lot of us think about that. Uh, I know I try to. Um, I have my compost bin out in the backyard and, and uh, recycle that way. But uh, it, it's an absolute honor and a pleasure to, to meet you in person. And. Uh, Thank you very much for all of you coming out here. I wish, I know this, all the seats are almost all full, but you know, for a presentation like this, there really does need to be a lot more people here listening to, to people's life experiences, uh, even if they're from another culture. And, and it's important for all of us to, to, to connect that way. That's how, how we are, we talk Oyas and we're all related. You know, is to, to get that information and, and share that love from human to human. That's what it's all about. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to conclude by saying a few words about what our philosophy behind the actions that we do. Our institute has a motto which is respect. First, as Palestinians, as native indigenous people, we respect ourselves. We believe we can liberate ourselves. This is self-empowerment. This is what first level of respect. And as you know, mental colonization is actually more dangerous than physical colonization. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the civil rights movement, they used to say, even free your mind and your ass will fall. So, uh, Stephen Biko in South Africa said something similar. The best weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. If they control our minds, if they tell us, as you said, we can do this, we can do that, you know, and we obey, then we have a problem. So the first is self-respect. The second is respect for other human beings, which I showed you in the beginning that Palestine has always been multicultural, multi-religious, multilingual even society, and we must respect each other. And the third level of respect is respect for the animals and plants and the earth that, that sustains us, you know? This is, this is also in Native American culture, is very important that the earth is the mother that sustains us and we must respect and not destroy uh, this, uh, this land that sustains us. So this is our philosophy that guides our work, uh, not just at the Institute, by the way, but in other work that we do uh, in Palestine. And I just want to finish with a few pictures of the people because you see me and Jesse and you think all of the people are old, we're the oldest people. <laughs> the people we work with are all the young people that uh, do the work. And uh, for example, the group of young people there built that biogas unit in one day, which actually produces gas for us to, to use. They uh, do things like pick olives or make apricot jams and things like that. 
Jesse, by the way, is the volunteer coordinator. So if you want to, to volunteer, you can talk to her also. We provide room and board for volunteers. We provide good food uh, also, m much of it from our garden and things like that. So we think you don't need to think outside the box. The box is imaginary and you can do whatever you put your mind to it. And uh, our mission, our goals, our ambitions, this is what the Institute will look like in a couple of years, as Jesse mentioned. And uh, this Institute will be big. And we already have the most important Institute dealing with climate change and habitat destruction in Western Asia, in my humble opinion. We publish two research papers every month and we teach thousands of children through that process of self-motivated learning. Uh, this is our website if you want to, uh, to look us up and look what we do. Um, for what we do, of course, is not desirable by the colonizers and not uh, friendly to the colonizers. This is me being arrested a few times. <laughs> uh, you see my t-shirt up there in the upper right hand corner. It says, got human rights, Palestinians don't. So <clears throat> we encourage you to join us uh, in this struggle. I don't like the word solidarity because it implies that somehow uh, my struggle and his struggle are somehow different. No, it's all part of our human struggle. And uh, solidarity implies that you are just feeling sorry for these other guys. But it's really one Earth, one planet that faces the threats, the six threats that I talked about earlier, like climate change and pollution and wars and conflict and greed. These impact everywhere on Earth. And unless we humans get together and do things together, we're, we're really in deep. Uh, and, and we must uh, stop this or we're all, our children, grandchildren are not going to have a livable planet. Uh, microplastics is everywhere now. We're ingesting it as a medical genesis. I tell you, you know, cancer rates are increasing, congenital birth defects, you know, infertility, all of these things are really related to the pollution that we see. When you have all these cars on the street, by the way, you should have public infrastructure now that includes slight speed, rail, you know, light rails and, and railroads that uh, and, and produce less uh, pollution. Car tires, when they wear out, where do you think all that goes? Comes in our water that we drink, microplastics. So we really need to rethink the model that we have, which is unfettered capitalism, <coughs> neoliberal attitudes, and we must all have the best of everything. We need to think about sustainability. So I promised to repeat my message at the beginning, so <laughs> 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 to remind you, what is my message? Diversity is good. For the life of me, I could never understand people who want to live with just people like them, all white people or all uh, Christians or all Jewish people, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, you know, I think diversity is great. And it's interesting and it makes life interesting. It's boring if we don't have diversity, so why not have diversity in our societies? You know, my own family is a mixed family. You know, I have my father's Greek Orthodox, my mother's Lutheran, I have uh, distant cousins who became Muslims, I have uh, you know, uh, my sister went to Utah and became a Mormon. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. It makes life interesting. You know, my uh, son, uh, you know, his partner is Jewish uh, and he dated a Jewish girl. You know, <laughs> what is wrong with that? It's, it's wonderful. It's, it's what life is about. Diversity. In nature, diversity is strength. When you see a forest like all pine trees, that's not a healthy forest. A healthy forest is one that has diversity of trees. The same for human societies. So 
this is the message I wanted you to take, and, uh, and also that you can have a role if you choose to join us in this joint struggle for a livable earth that we share, this beautiful planet. Thank you very much for your hospitality and for inviting us on. I'm happy to take questions or discussions. We have enough time for maybe two questions because we have to be out of here in about 10 minutes. I'm actually going to excel yeah, a little Make sure you sign the email list that passed around. If you haven't gotten a chance, it's in the back. Sign it because we'd like to stay in touch. There's also my cards with Jesse. We can leave up out there if you want to get in touch with me since we have limited time for discussion. Go ahead. And anyone uh, donating to PIMS tonight gets a free notebook or face mask with kafia or hot uh, scarf. So also, go ahead. Any questions? Go ahead, Kim. Yeah, this will be big, but how do you keep your hope going in the face? I've seen that you're spiritual because I've read some of that. There's a lot of hate. Is anger okay? And what? You're an expert on America because I, the wheels of justice were all over the country. I don't know, he had a bus that was educational in the United States. And if Philip wanted to answer that as an indigenous person, really short, do you have hope in the face of this? And that's my basic question, but is anger okay? We don't want hatred. So those are the kind of things I would ask. Yeah, uh, I mean, as you, maybe I'll take a couple more questions and then we can answer them all together. Oh, so yeah. you wanna just Mine's not really a question, it's just informative for the people here and for you, that the Palestinians are trying to create a cultural garden at the Cleveland Gar uh, Cultural Gardens. Okay. And right now they have 280 signatures, they need 500. So um, a young man that I know, George Harp, He's working on it very diligently. So, and um, the petitions on change.org. But if everyone can sign the petition so they can get their 500 signatures and hopefully get their garden, because they've had some um, problems trying to move forward. Don will send the link out if you give the yes. link to Don. Yeah, we'll share that link. Uh, with all the people that attended tonight. Anybody else? Someone else have a question? Oh, please do. Yeah, I did have a question. And, um, you know, it made me think of this question when I saw your map that included the offshore oil deposits yes. in the um, base in the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean basin there. So um, I think that's really important. And, you know, I'm Lebanese, my dad's Lebanese. And, you know, we remember a time, you know, until 2006, when south of Lebanon was totally controlled by Israel. And, you know, you had Moshe Dayan and Ben-Gurion saying that they want all of the water from the Watani River. So, it kind of, do you see that, is Palestine really the end of kind of this extractive nature of this settler colonial process, or is it kind of really a threat to uh, anybody who gets in its way? You know, I don't know if I made it clear with my yeah, examples, but, I got yeah. Uh, yes, the Zionist project has ambitions much bigger than Palestine, and it's actually, even now the U.S., of course, sends billions of dollars to Israel and sends them the highest technology that the U.S. makes, and Israel even uses this technology to make their own weapons and uh, against American law, you can turn that off because of the, uh, uh, against American law, they repackage it and sell it to others like in India and other countries. In terms of extraction of natural resources, you're absolutely right. Israel is the only country on earth that never set its own borders. Mm -hmm. and is still thinking about domination of the whole Middle East, uh, including uh, the southern half of Lebanon to the Litani River, 
and the gas fields off of Lebanon, as you know. The gas fields off of Gaza is the reason that Gaza is blockaded and besieged, not because of Hamas or rockets or anything else. Uh, and so uh, and that's why fishermen are not allowed more than six nautical miles into the sea, because it's seven nautical miles that they start to be close to the gas fields that Israel is now sucking and, and uh, even uh, beginning to export them to Europe to replace Russian gas that they cut off. The, um, and to this day, we don't know who blew up the Russian yes, we uh, pipe stream <laughs> yes, we do. We from down. Russia to Germany, but we kind of know. Yeah. Uh, but anyways, uh, this is, and I answered your question intentionally because the question about hope is what I wanted to end with. Um, now, my family is Palestinian Christian, and Muslims also respect Jesus as a prophet. And Jesus had taught us something very important, which is what? You don't hate your enemy, you hate the action of your enemy. Mm -hmm. So Jesus himself toppled the, the tables, if you know, uh, <laughs> in the temple and challenged the oppressor. And that's why he was killed. We consider him the first Palestinian martyr. He was killed in Palestine for his action. So we emulate, whether Muslims or Christians, we emulate the message of Jesus, which is that you must challenge oppression. You must challenge, you must stand with the oppressed people. Jesus didn't go stand with the Roman tax collectors. He went stood with the lepers and people who needed him. So this is, this is our message. Our message is that uh, we hate the actions that the Israelis are doing now. I don't hate the Israelis because you know, eventually I consider them uh, deluded, mistaken, addicted. I consider them like I consider uh, one of my cousins who was addicted to alcohol and drugs. I feel sorry for him because he's also self-damaging. It's not damaging just to the people around him, he's damaging to, to himself. And I think the same thing about even the Israeli soldier who stood on me with his knee and, and cracked my rib. I don't hate the person, I hate the action. And I challenge the action. And I lost, since I went back to Palestine in 2008, 23 of my own personal friends who were killed by the Israelis. And yet, I do not preach a message of hate. I say that there is no win-lose here situation. We're not going to end up, and I'm not sure Algeria was a win for the Algerians, because as I said, three million martyrs is not a win, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and nor a lose for the genocide of the natives, as I said. The likelihood is a win-win situation. The other option for us humans is a lose-lose situation. <laughs> as Martin Luther King so eloquently put it, we either live together as fellow human beings or we die together as fools. There is no win-lose here. So we need to work on this aspect of what we do and how we do it. And, and that doesn't mean pacifism, it, does, it means aggressive, aggressive resistance. And Palestinians have been resisting. Actually, without that resistance, I wouldn't be here speaking to you. I would be probably in a refugee camp in Lebanon or Syria. Uh, you know, if my family did not resist and stick their guns up, if you want. That is the reality of what we face. So where do I draw hope? I draw hope from people. People are amazing. I mean, I wrote a book, a whole book about the subject. If you're interested, I'm happy to share it with you in a PDF file, because again, I don't believe in copyrights to the chagrin of my editor, but <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, titled is Popular Resistance in Palestine, a History of Hope and Empowerment. Subtitles, A History of Hope and Empowerment. Because it is a history of hope and empowerment. And without that resistance, Palestine would not have only been gone. Lebanon and Syria and Jordan would have been gone. We Palestinians 
are actually defending the Arabs from the expansion of the Zionist project and were causing them pain <laughs> and causing them to rethink what they are doing and now many Israelis are coming to our side. I can tell you on my own email list, which if you if you sign there and put your email, and especially if you write it in a legible way, <laughs> if you write it in an illegible way, you will never hear from me again. Uh, but anyways, uh, on this email list I have 50,000 people, more than 50,000, of which at least 5,000, 5,500 or so are Jews. Many of them are anti-Zionist, post-Zionist. I also have some Zionists on my list. When I talk to them, and, I, and the post-Zionists and anti-Zionists are even more radical than I am <laughs> in many ways. Uh, so I think there is hope because there are people who are changing their views. Who are, there is a recent petition that signed by over 2,000 people. I just signed it. Most of the signatories are academics and intellectuals in the state of Israel calling, uh, it's called the elephant in the room uh, because the demonstrations in Israel and Tel Aviv are ignoring the elephant in the room, which is the Palestine question and the Palestinians and they want their fellow citizens to, uh, to understand that this is the crux of the problem. Israel can normalize with the United Arab Emirates or Bahrain or Morocco or whatever and they can get billions of dollars from the US as they do. They get shielded from international law by the US. They get support from England, France, Russia, all these countries. But unless they solve the issue of the Palestinians, they are not going to live in peace. Period. Phil, do you have anything to say about hope? Or do you have anything no, wrong? I think he, he, he summed it up perfectly. As a yeah. business person, you faced 500 years. Yeah. Thank you for being here. I, uh, one time I was in Oklahoma with uh, some Native Americans there, and this guy who impacted me so much by his teaching. Uh, he taught me so much about Native Americans and he said to me, as long as there's one Native American alive, there's hope. <laughs> but to me, that's, that sums it up. Uh, you know, and uh, they, cannot, they cannot kill everybody. Uh, and, but, but more importantly, they cannot kill the spirit of humanity and the spirit that allowed some white people in the north to help smuggle blacks to the north you know, during slavery. That's the spirit that we want, and that's the spirit of hope. That's in each and every one of you. If you think in the US, what are the positive things that happen in this country? Like this 40-hour work week, like social security, <laughs> like women right to vote, you know, which happened only in the 20s, by the way. <laughs> or like uh, civil rights, or like uh, ending the war in Vietnam, or ending U.S. support for South Africa. How did all of those happen? Was it because some politician was elected who saw the light? <laughs> it was because politicians do this, they stick their finger in the air and see where the wind is blowing. And we must provide them with a hurricane if we want to change. That's what we must do. We must all push and keep pushing. That's the power of the people. That's where hope comes from. And I think, my brother, we are with you. We are enjoying the struggle for that future. Thank you.